Welcome to the fall 2023. I can't believe it's the fall 2023 Drone Legends <laughs> webinar. We've been doing these for about three years now. Some of you may have remembered the old Zipline drones, which was one of the first that we did. Um, and we've been trying to do these pretty frequently. Uh, we haven't done them as much as I'd like to of late, but we're going to try to change that and do these more often because I think they're a lot of fun and they're they're we get some great speakers like Jim tonight, who I'll introduce in a moment, that really showcase how drones are being used. We talk about it all the time, and it's great to actually see a company or individuals that are actually walking the walk. So here we go. All right, why? For those of you that have known us for a while, you understand why we do, why we do what we do. We believe that inside every one of us lives a legend. And that's just our way of saying that there's some unique potential in every one of us. And we use the magic of drones to unlock the unique potential in children around the world and even those adults that are teaching this thing. It's um, it's really been amazing to see how everybody resonates with this kind of a theme. So let's get started here. You know, Drone Legends is growing. Where before we were at STEM Fundamentals and you've seen our one product, um, we've, we're now growing from the K through 12. We're really helping educators make learning interesting and relevant. And the way that we do it is through that drone technology, but we make it simple, it's turnkey, and we make it really easy to implement. And so at the kindergarten level, we're working on Little Legends, which will be launching later this year. And that'll be showcasing Gimbal and a group of little legends, and they'll be going through drone-themed adventures. Uh, to the right is the STEM Fundamentals program that most of you are familiar with now and running. Adam, you should see this thing. I might send you a book, my friend. We just launched FPV Initiator yesterday. That is a first-person view drone piloting program. We're in the goggles. Adam, what do you think of these? Pretty cool. You sit in the cockpit, you're flying these. That is called FPV Initiator that launched yesterday. And we've got the Unified Scholastic Drone Racing Association, which is where people will actually compete virtually and in real life. This is great. Adam's shaking his head like, yeah, I think I want a piece of that. Okay. Step fundamentals, based on real world scenarios. We're going to talk about one tonight, right? So we talk about fighting fires. We're, we're helping researchers in Antarctica. We're tracking endangered species. So everything that we do is based on real world scenarios. Little legends on the left. We've got a new coding program in the middle, Egypt. For those of you that are with us now and are using STEM fundamentals, Egypt is now free with STEM fundamentals. So you should have received an email the other week letting you know that you're in the new portal and you now have access to this. If you didn't, you'll email me and we'll get you set up. And then FPV initiator on the right. So this is the growing drone legends world. What do you think, Adam? Look pretty cool. All right, man. So why? Because drones are the future and the future is today. The global drone services market, this is, this is an incredible number, 134.8 billion by the year 2028. So why? This is why we do it because there's these tremendous career opportunities for the young children that we're working with in this space, whether they're drone operators, engineers, programmers, or supporting the business in one way, shape, or another. It's a tremendous opportunity for these young students to get involved in this early aviation pathway that could be great career opportunities as they age up. 16 years old to get your part 107 license. Jim and I both have ours. Um, this is a great opportunity. And, and just look at what we're doing. I mean, Adam, do you remember we were talking about putting the drone on Mars? Well, it's been up there now for two and a half years, almost two years. And it's, it's defying all odds. So we're doing space exploration, wildlife conservation, agriculture, not just spraying, but using sophisticated imaging technology to capture important data to feed back to the farmers. Is, it, is water pooling, is it too hot, too dry? Great information is called precision agriculture. Our friends at Zipline Drones changing the world through medicine delivery, fighting fires, and actually helping bees pollinate flowers. And today we're gonna to talk about another use case with Jim. And that's joining us tonight is a great segue. Everybody meet Jim Robinson. Um, I'm really excited about tonight because Jim has what I think is just a really cool background. You know, he's worked for the Weather Channel. He's a passionate storyteller. He's got his part 107. This is a weather drone guy. How much more weather drone can you get? So um, we are really, really excited. He is the U.S. Director of Marketing for Mediomatics, 
the company he's representing today, and they've got something that's very cool called the Meteo Drone. And the Meteo Drone is what we're going to learn about today, right? Um, I love seeing my baby up there. Isn't that neat? Look at this. I love this picture, by the way. I think this picture should just be my background from now on. Um, Jim's going to talk to us about how they're using these drones in specific atmospheric areas to collect weather observations from this, what they call the middle atmosphere, which I think is pretty fascinating. It would have never been on my radar had I not seen it. No pun intended, right? Weather radar. All right. Without further ado, Jim, you are up. I'm going to stop sharing and we're going to let Jim take over. So I think the best thing though I want to do before I start is if if you're joining us and you want to be able to see, I'm going to present some video and some some other imagery that I'd like you to be able to see. And I think uh, Scott and I have, have sort of played around with this. Uh, and as long as you're in the speaker mode, um, if you go in the upper right corner of your screen, you'll you'll be able to see this and sort of it's all of its, you know, beautiful, large glory um, instead of a little tiny uh, thumbnail, which uh, you may have seen uh, to kick this off. But yeah, so Scott, everybody, I'm so excited to be here. My name's Jim, like you mentioned. Um, a drone geek, a weather geek, and I am extremely lucky to have been able to find a position uh, with a fantastic company that actually helped me combine both of my loves uh, into uh, one fantastic uh, opportunity. And I, I'm super excited to share this with you. And when Scott reached out to us, um, it just felt like an awesome fit. And I, I commend uh, the effort that's being done here, especially when STEM uh, my wife uh, leads STEM here in our county as well, and uh, it is a fantastic, well, it, it needs to be supported even more, and I'm glad that uh, y'all are doing that. So I want to start this off with uh, a question, and I want to see how many people can actually answer this and really want to start sort of at the at the very base of our understanding here a little bit. So let's start with a good question. Who invented the first weather data sensor capable of being attached to a helium balloon or any hydrogen balloon too, I suppose. Does anybody have an idea who this individual is? Y'all are quiet. Sandy, who is it? Oh, I was uh, thinking Edison. <laughs> no, it is a French scientist by the name of Robert Bureau in 1929. Uh, Bureau coined the term radio sond, not that not too complicated, radio to transmit data and sond, which is just French for probe. So uh, oh. uh, amazing, uh, uh, amazing uh, work by him. And he sort of set the standard and and it began to grow uh, after that. Do we still use them? Well, yeah, uh, we do. Uh, we use them quite a bit, actually. Um, and it, uh, it's pretty phenomenal how much we actually use them. We use them uh, twice a day, daily, every day. Uh, they are launched from approximately 900 locations worldwide, 101 in the US. Um, these are what these balloons are carrying. Now, this snapshot I, I, I grabbed from the National Weather Service. This is what their probe looks like. It captures uh, temperature, air pressure, relative humidity, and it's all doing that while it's being carried aloft. And to really sort of understand what we're talking about, you kind of do this, uh, I, you know, it's a multi-layered cake. I've heard people, uh, my, my uh, a former colleague of mine called it the, the hamburger, um, but this is really our atmosphere. It's broken into four different zones. You have the thermosphere, the mesosphere, the stratosphere, and the troposphere. And I've got uh, one more question for the room. Do you know which zone we care about regarding weather? Any idea? Scott, you know, don't you? Come on. The thermosphere. All right. <laughs> it's actually the troposphere. It is where all humans on Earth and all living creatures and everybody else experience weather. And this goes up to 33,000 feet. So good try. Uh, appreciate the participation. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, understanding the understanding the the vertical height uh, and and really getting a, a snapshot of what is there is so important, especially when you're talking about weather. Now, you have to imagine that when you're doing this much work, 
uh, in this space, it's a little bit expensive. Um, matter of fact, the ballooning costs are ballooning. Uh, you know, it's it's pretty it's pretty crazy to think how much we spend on weather balloons. Each one, including the radio sons that are attached, are about four hundred to six hundred dollars a piece. I'm gonna let that sink in for a second. Nine hundred plus locations globally. This is a uh, it's it yeah it's expensive. Um, it's mind blowing. Some might say. One more thing, everybody. <laughs> there's this. Uh, we have helium shortages. <laughs> so there's that. Uh, and also, uh, we have another thing uh, that uh, is is kind of leaking in. You know, it's the, there's a growing demand and a limited supply. Uh, the National Weather Service has actually switched uh, a lot of their balloons to hydrogen gas instead. Makes sense. You know, it's it's available you can make it it's not that big of a deal except hydrogen is famously flammable and helium is not um let me be the first to say right now that yeah it you know hydrogen is definitely one of those gases that you got to be careful with but the national weather service does do a lot to mitigate the risk they are doing a lot to make sure that what they are when they are using this gas uh for this particular instance they're doing everything possible to make sure that it is not a problem so we talked about sort of the 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 problem, the cost, things like that. Let's talk about the solution. Now, uh, I think Scott alluded earlier that we we sort of have one. And it's my favorite, drones. Come on. This is the best. It's the greatest it's the greatest solution ever. More specifically, it's the meteor drone, which is what we have, which is even more awesome. Um, nothing like your your DJI drone that you fly in the backyard, or or uh, uh, you know your Tello drone. Although now that I think about it, um, that would be kind of cool if you actually could strap stuff to a Tello drone and get weather measurements. All right, that's 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 another episode. So let me uh, give you just sort of a, a brief introduction. This is these are my colleagues. Our drones are actually made from the ground up. That one right there included, and a lot of them, if not all of them. Are 3D printed. So these are my colleagues. Again, I, I, I'm super proud of the work that they all do. And it is really phenomenal to think that we have gotten to, into a place where we're not only flying drones that capture weather, we're making them in the same building that I go when I check my emails when I'm in Switzerland, which is where we're based in. Uh, it's a little town and it's uh, about an hour outside of Zurich. Beautiful if you ever get there. Cows are out, there's cows all over the countryside just eating grass. It's beautiful and stunning, um, and it's it's interesting because you, as you're sitting in there, you're uh, you're doing sort of like you know your regular office things. I'm checking my email and and you know as you're as you're just sitting there, you kind of hear that whoop, 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 whoop. there's machines, just 3D printers everywhere, just kind of going off. It's just uh, it's pretty stunning. So um, I I it is it is absolutely one of my favorite places to be. Uh, simply because they all share the same love that I do. So I was there a few weeks ago and I shot some video. Uh, this is uh, our drone pilot, Ramon, one of one of about 10 that we have. Our drone goes up to about 20,000 feet above ground level. That's six kilometers in your, if you're in the metric system, which they are, and I have to do a lot of conversions. Uh, our drones capture temperature, humidity, air pressure, wind speed, and direction. Best part is they're reusable, they're cost effective, they're safer, and they're better for the environment. So it's a sort of a, a big win-win all the way around. So I'm I'm super excited to, to be able to be a part of that. Let's go into uh, a little bit more about the drones themselves. So these drones are are really mobile weather stations, right? They are helping existing weather models further the forecast and improve the forecast because they are gathering better information at that zone where it's really hard to get reliable data. And one specific thing that I like to call out is our founder, uh, uh, Dr. Fengler, Dr. Martin Fengler, He's a pilot. He's a he's a private pilot. And he hated the fact that he couldn't tell when it was going there was going to be fog on the ground. 
He said, you know what, I've got to figure out a way to, to fix this. Um, and doing so, he was able to, uh, with some very smart engineers, come up with the Meteo drones and then ultimately our platform. Uh, but we don't have a lot of information about being able to predict thunderstorms uh, in a in a very well-defined and accurate manner. So this is really helping a lot of the 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 improvement of the data. Now we can get we can get a lot. We can get a lot of weather data, but this really improves our forecasting, which is you know vitally important. So there's some information about the drone, but I want to do something real quick here first because I have the privilege of having one of these right here. This is the Meteo drone. Uh, it is about 13 pounds. It is six kilometers, it's got a, a six kilograms. Six, yeah, is that, yeah. Uh, and you can see that it is, it is a pretty robust machine. Um, this one in particular has, there's a parachute <laughs> spot right up in here where we actually have a a parachute that will come out um the great thing that i like to tell people is uh yeah we uh we've had an in we've had times when we've had to deploy the parachute but it's because we were testing and we had to the regulators were making us test it since then we haven't lost one yet but if they do come down they come down slow and safely. So when you're flying these uh, straight up and straight down, it's usually not an issue. But if it, if for some reason it, it, it's straight off target and we had to deploy that, we could. And it's um, it's pretty incredible. So yeah, this, uh, my neighbors don't love when I fly this in the backyard, as you can probably figure out. But no, I'm just kidding. They all support me. They all, they all think I'm a little crazy, but that's okay. Uh, it's all it's all for science, right? So, all right, let's go back. Let me go back and just kind of break down what exactly uh, our cool Meteo drones are, what they do, what they have. Six, uh, they have six motors. Um, yeah, almost got one. Yeah, okay. Uh, they can withstand max wind speeds of ninety kilometers an hour. That's fifty-six miles per hour. Uh, that's a uh, that's a lot. That's, you know, speed limit on most roads, if you follow the speed limit. You should always follow the speed limit. Uh, the max altitude for this particular model is uh, 6,000 kilometers, or 6,000 meters, or six kilometers, I should say. Uh, and that's uh, above mean sea level. These batteries last for about 40 minutes, and they can be swapped out in field to, to help with continuous uh, profiling. The vertical speed is... Uh, is uh yeah these things whip up really quick 10 meters per second um you you hear them for a second and they're gone <laughs> takeoff weighs about 13 pounds if you want to do the conversion we do live tele uh, telemetry and uh the other really awesome thing is that we actually have uh propeller warmers and technology that keep these from icing up so when it's you know way up there uh they're not you know in trouble of of falling to the ground because you've got icing on the on the propellers. The way that these are controlled um, is we have a. I'm gonna put this down because it's getting heavy. But we have two different ways to to operate these drones. This one is sort of like the remote that you would have for you know your hobby drone, your DJI. Although DJI does have a lot of professional stuff, I shouldn't say that. But if you've got any typical drone that you're that you're used to, you're going to have a, a remote like this, except for ours has the safeguarded emergency trigger, which is covered by that little thing. And on some of the remotes, it says, do not push <laughs> unless a dire emergency. Uh, and that would actually trigger our parachute and have it come safely to the ground. Um, so, yeah, it's a it's a it's a it is a, uh, a phenomenal um, piece of work. And then our drones capture, you know, everything that that a, a balloon would: um, pressure, temperature, relative humidity, dew point, uh, wind speed and direction. And uh, they com we, we compute the wind speed and direction from roll, nick, and yaw. And we get a lot of we get a lot of questions, especially when you're talking about balloons and and you talk about the arc that happens and how can you how can you tell, you know. Because usually when the balloon goes up, you can kind of 
get a lot of data based on the arc of it. Um, and the arc, it kind of goes into the air and, and yeah, we can, we can do that with using the measurements from, from the specific drone itself. Then we have, a uh, two more, or the, the other, the other means of have, having a, one of these giant drones, um, mobile weather stations, but also we have a permanent weather station that's a medial base. And I'm going to show you real quickly here what that looks like. So this is our medio base. Um, it is like, it's, you know, it's like a garage. It's a, it's a garage for your, your very cool drone. Um, and it will allow the drone to, to go up, do its vertical profile, come back down, charge, and then do it again when, when you have a fully charged battery. And these are deployed in different areas around Switzerland right now. We have one that we just deployed in North Dakota at Grand, uh, Grand Forks Air Force Base. And we are actually contributing to what we call a 1K model, which basically means that we can forecast right down to your backyard. It's, uh, it's pretty incredible what we're able to do with, with this amount of uh, hyper, hyper local, high resolution data. And we also use it for different areas of in different sectors. So military uses and, and things like that. It's a it's a cool, it's a cool uh, you know, it's one of the cool drones, right, Scott? Very right. Yep, it's cool. That was cool. Um, are we ready to open up for questions? I I'm I think I'm ready. All right, I'm going back to gallery mode so we can do this. How's that? Doing gallery mode, yes. My mode back to gallery mode so I can see everybody here. Um, there are some questions. So first off, Jim, that was really cool. Thank you. I think um, very, very cool to see what's going on in the weather space with drones. I mean, it makes complete sense uh, when you think about what you've just shown us is like a completely great use case in terms of just being able to come up, deploy, come back down. I love the meteor station. Is that... You so you have pilots, but I think you I think you alluded to it in the in the station there that that's is that an autonomous flight is that programmed to kind of go up and down on time intervals or how does that work? Yeah, the media base is actually controlled. We have a a web based software that we can actually trigger this and have it go up and actually do the vertical profiles. Um, but we also have the ability to have the actual drone itself in these large cases that with with the remote like you saw. And you can actually do the the vertical profiles in as as often as you as you can with the batteries uh, wherever you are. So in that case, yeah, you would you would have your, your part one hundred seven. Um, you would have a, a you have specific training to enable to in order to know what you're doing, what you're getting, and that to actually get this up safely. And you know, it's it's one of those instances where it's it's so flexible and agile that it can be used in just about any instance uh whether you're collecting weather data to to help feed a model or to understand what's gonna you know, what's really gonna happen or if you need to really see how a specific scene is gonna is going to uh, be influenced by weather that's that's how you do it but yeah you you have absolute manual control if you want it if you're ready if you're if you are are more comfortable and you have a specific use case where you need to go, somewhere other than just straight up and straight down on a regular basis. Um, you also have the ability to to mount a uh, visual uh, capture on here as well. And you can see, you know, at that boundary line, you can really begin to understand more of, of what's happening at that at that height, which, you know, I mean, I, I wish I wish my uh, my other little drone would would do that because that would be insane. <laughs> maybe maybe you know. Nutella will do that, Adam. Yeah. Uh yeah. So, so I have some interesting questions. So Sarah uh, has a question. Uh, she has two questions. Uh, one's maybe an observation. She wants to know if we can see some of the weather data that it collects. I don't know if you have any images or anything like that that you can share with us of like data that it coll actually collects. I do. And if I, right, so let's do that first. Okay. If you want to switch let's... back to like presentation mode or something like that, we can, yeah. we can look at some of that. Let me, here, let me do this. I'm going to, the software I'm using here to kind of just, display everything is I just need to add it in here. I'm gonna let me just run a little bit of video here quick while I update that. Oh, that's great. Check that out guys. 
So you can kind of see, this is actually a, a demo we did in Ireland um, wow, where you can actually see it, go, see it go all the way up. And I will show you the, the skew T so you can actually see the data that we're pulling in. Oh, look at that. That's amazing. Oh, that's cool. Now, Jim, how high is that guy going? This one was a six kilometer flight. I think it was 5,500 or uh, yeah, wow. just, just at just 55 or six. Wow, look at uh, that. Yeah, kilometer. Look through the clouds there. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So, and I'm going to go back and show you. Really cool. So this is this is one of our skew tees. Let me just try to center it up a little bit there for you. Yeah, you may want to switch your your view so that you can really see what's happening here. And I'm happy to zoom in too if you if you'd like to see a little bit more. But um, this is so the data they can collect right here. So it's a vertical profile. It's a true vertical profile. It goes straight up and straight down. So you, you can see exactly where the dew point is. You can see exactly where um, you have that that temperature that temperature change. Me. Yeah. Okay. I hope that, that answers your question, Sarah. Sarah, did that answer your question? I think it may. Yeah, yes. great. Excellent. Um, and then I'm back in like speaker mode. I'm going to go back to my grid view because I think that's gallery view is kind of cool. So uh, Trish just joined us. So yeah, somebody's asking about the 40 minutes per flight time. That's Francine. Yeah, Francine. I mean, I Jim, Jim can talk to that, but I mean, 40 minutes on that size of a drone is probably about right. I think that's Somebody who comes up with the best battery technology is really going to take it home for a lot of different reasons. But um, well, there's... and the next iteration of our drone is going to is going to uh, crack that ceiling even more. So uh, we are we're definitely we're we're definitely uh, facing that same challenge of how do you how do you pack in more power without increasing the load of uh, the the actual weight itself and still be able to get up to the uh, the next layer and for, I, I wish I could give you a delivery date, but we're talking about that the next drone is actually going to be in the jet stream. Um, so you're talking about 56 mile an hour winds are that's out the window now. I mean, like you're, you're talking about a much different experience really uh, that we have to, we have to fight with. So, so that, that raises some good. So here in the States, you're dealing with, um, I mean, obviously you're working with the FAA, and you've got to have specific waivers. Are you in designated air? So are you restricted to certain areas at certain times? Obviously, I mean, it seems that that would be the case. How does it work if you're trying to get weather data in different locations on, oh gosh, am I going to say it? Like on the fly. Sorry. You the, 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 the best answer I can give you is that right now, everything is waivered. Everything because of the way that the, the airspace is. Um, we are working with the FAA uh, pretty closely, actually, specifically with the ADSB that that is coming out and it was just pushed to March now, yeah. uh, if you know if you know about that. Um, and this more or less means that our drone has to carry a transponder on it now that will communicate uh, its location, its serial number, um, its height, weight, uh, all the things it likes, uh, you know, walks on the beach, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's got to transfer, it's got to transmit all this data uh, uh, by March. And so, we're, yeah, we're working very closely with the FAA. And uh, it's at this point, it's really early to start thinking about how do we get these deployed to those heights, uh, those altitudes uh, in a mobile configuration right now just because we're working with the government and there are a lot of variables that go into this so at this point it's sort of like you know with with, with our latest drone uh deployment in north dakota it was because we had special air we had special air uh special permission to be in that airspace anyway um hmm. because it's already a testing space uh which makes things a lot easier especially if um we can uh, deploy these in anywhere 
that's already used to having that that special clearance anyways and can issue the no tams pretty quickly um and we're it's it, you know it, we're fighting the same thing that a lot of a lot of the the drone operators and and manufacturers um and companies are doing as well i mean it's just you know it's it's a lot of uh i don't want to say bureaucracy but sometimes sometimes it is but at the same time you know getting the technology to where we need it to be um is is a huge is a huge thing as well so um we're going to see eventually where we will be able to to help get those waivers and help work with individuals and 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 other companies and and things like that to be able to get you know your your drone up to those to those critical heights because eventually the point of all of this is when we have all of these drones if you can imagine we have these weather drones sort of everywhere just like you know weather balloons your weather data your forecasting data is going to be that much better because we are feeding more and more and more of this data into the models and then you're going to see an improved we've already seen improved uh forecasting because of this in switzerland uh we have a uh what's called a 1k a euro 1k again we can forecast down to your backyard because of this kind of technology that that's out there with drones and uh, it's it's already a game changer um and when we start doing even more of these developments in the united states it's going to be um i i think it's really going to ultimately be one of those things that is going to change the way that we fundamentally look at forecasting cool hey i have some other questions uh how many how many states right now in the u.s are using either yours or other types of drones for weather forecasting. Do you have any sense of what that looks like? Our drones right now, our drones are the only ones that are clear to go to the altitudes that are needed in order to get that, what that vertical profile. Um, and we're the only ones who actually have drones that are sending, that are doing any sort of uh, data capture right now. Um, and we have, again, we have the bait, we have the one in North Dakota, um, there are a, a few other more government-related uh, use cases um, where it's it's we're we're working with them so that they can do mobile weather stations, um, you know, on the fly. But right now, the 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 biggest one that we have that's permanent is again in North Dakota. Cool, thank you. Um, so. You mentioned the newer model being able to withstand, I think you said 55 something miles an hour. Higher, higher. <laughs> yeah. the wind speed, right? The wind speed. So, you know, we have aircraft that fly into the eyes of hurricanes, right? To kind of check out that kind of thing. Is there any plans in the future? Do you think there's a drone? Would it be a, would it be a, would it be like a multi-rotor VTOL, like a vertical takeoff and land, which is currently what you have? Or do you think, is there any, thoughts about fixed wing aircraft flying into the eyes of a, are, are they doing that already? Are they, are they unmanned or do you know if they're unmanned? Come well, I do know that the hurricane hunters are flying very nice planes up there and, and doing these, these uh, dropping the sons from, from the air. Um, and, and again, I mean, that's, you're, you're still flying human beings into yeah. the eye of a storm and eye of a hurricane, which is uh, a little bit nerve wracking, but I, I, I mean, I'm I'm sort of a you know I, I I can definitely see these becoming the replacement for uh, mm -hmm. your hurricane hunting planes and your your aircraft that need to go out and actually uh, sample the air and sample the data that's happening uh, in these vicious violent storms. You know how how and how that's going to happen. It's you know I think that's still to be that's still to be figured out. Um, I know there's a lot of very smart people who are who are working on that now, but yeah, I would say that our future, I hope at least, I mean, I'm being seeing what I've seen so far, I'm really hoping and I'm really positive that we're gonna stop sending humans up there um in in regular manned aircraft to get this kind of data. I think it's going to be one of those things where we are going to have a uh, it, it's it's going to be a, a place where we're actually sending up something like this that's very a lot more robust than than our current one uh, in order to to do that. But it looks pretty robust. So it's pretty um, robust. So thinking about that, and maybe you're not going up as that high, but do you have any? Is there any consideration given to 
air density as you get higher are, are you not going that high to even to that for that to matter in terms of like atmospheric pressure or lack of kind of um what's the word i'm looking for uh, you want to ride one of these up there don't you you want to ride up to the stratosphere I and feel that but i mean i think about what they did with and, and certainly it's not it's not even yeah. close to being apples to apples it's probably the furthest thing away that it can be but i think about when we learned about the drone on mars for example like zero you know one sixtieth of earth's atmosphere well so they had to they're obviously they had to take into many considerations to get that thing to even have lift uh, I think it was like 2,500 RPM to just get the thing to lift off when it weighs like four pounds. So now with your drones, as you go higher and higher, do you have to take any of that into consideration? Um, or is that you're still staying in such a an altitude that that's not really a factor? We're still staying in that altitude. Um, now, the reason why is because the gap is really where we are. Uh, we're we're specifically targeting that gap in the in the atmosphere because we don't have reliable good data there. So we don't need to be where you're talking about that the sort of the low the low air pressure because it's it's covered. It's really the lower atmosphere that we're most concerned with because that is where the lack of data is that and again, we're we're looking for the the best places to put these drones and so that we're capturing the weather data that's going to impact the weather the most. That's really going to impact your day-to-day -day lives. Um, as much as possible. Now, I mean, we're going to get to a point where I think, sure, yeah. I mean, I think that'd be that would be a fundamental change in in a in a lot of things that we do, especially when you're talking about the cost that goes into keeping the data pipeline coming through from from that altitude. But yeah, I mean, I at, at this point, it's it's really more about the the weather that impacts you and your decisions and and businesses and. And how we live our lives at you know below thirty three thousand feet. Yeah, great. Does anybody have any other questions for Jim? I thought this was pretty cool. Weather drones. Oh, you got a you got a question from Kim. It looks like. Yeah. Um, yes, this is a great question from Kim. If you want to read it out, Jim. Oh, let me let me find my mouse. Hold on. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Students, oh, here for students interested in exploring this career path. What advice would you have for them? Participate I, in drone legends. Yeah, that's 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 number one. Um, really, I think it's important that you. I it, it's my hope, and especially in this household, that STEM is is a priority um, in the school districts. Uh, if it isn't, it should be. And if you're in a place where you feel like it doesn't exist yet. I feel like you got to push, you got to push hard um, to, to get it into your, your school system. And that means talking to mom and dad, that means talking to your school boards, that means talking to your teachers and your other advocates who are going to be able to, to really push that because ultimately STEM is going to be the, the birthplace of new innovation, especially in the drone space, especially when you're talking about the, the kind of innovation that's happening at, at a lightning pace. I never thought Scott, I never thought in a million years I'd be working for a company that captured weather data with a drone. I thought they were just neat, neat, you know, almost toys to have when they first came out. I was like, oh, this is cool. I can take pictures from the sky. Wonderful. But when you actually see the kind of work that's being done with them in a real, in a real situation, I mean, you're talking about the ability to place these in and 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 get these in places where they are going to one day save lives if they haven't already. So as a student, you have to really think about what sort of uh, STEM related, especially STEM related, you've got science, technology, and you've got math. Math is a major component when you're talking about meteorology and really innovating in, in the meteorological space. Um, I, if, if you can, if you have the ability, if you know somebody, if you can find a way to get your hands on a drone and understand aerodynamic aerodynamics, if you, if you can understand how weather stations even work, just just really getting a, getting your hands on everything possible to help craft a picture in your mind of what is possible. Because I think ultimately that's when the real innovation starts is when you have these these elements around you that can kind of spark that interest. And so- you know, depending on how old you are and what grade you're in and what school district you're you're near or you're in, it it really is going to be uh, uh, wildly important that you're following what 
what this the STEM path is and and really finding there are there I know there are many of these workshops and work sessions even if you have to to travel to a different city or a different town nearby and take part in that there's so much to learn when you're talking about uh these these four fundamental things that are making up the, the the very uh the very innovations that we're seeing today and especially in the drone space because again drones are i mean i think you're here for a reason because drones are cool they're interesting but there are a lot of different factors that are going into just operating a drone i mean if you think about it i mean there's every every possible thing you can think of is something you can do with a drone these days and it's going to take the next generation to really have the opportunity to to think long and hard about what their participation in this space is going to be and yeah i mean i would say it, it, there 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 are any number of of summer workshops for stem if you can find one of those try to go as often as you can a lot of times they they do have drone programs that will they'll have either a a, a pared down or pared down version or they'll have robotics or they'll have um math camps and it's it's just try to soak in as much as you can to make you as as diverse as possible in your education um you you don't you don't need to be a prodigy to be the next big innovator uh and and scientist and 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 really make something um for the for the generations to come i know it's a really long answer i'm so sorry oh, but i just feel I like I'm really passionate when it comes to STEM, yeah, especially just because. You are, and it's, it's, we, that is exactly what Drone Legends does, right? So we put the kids into these scenarios that let them see firsthand how drones are being used in the real world. A weather scenario would be the next phase. I think in That's one right. of the little legends, in fact, in the little legends, one of the new stories um, is called Hurricane Heroes, where Gimbal's doing a post hurricane relief mission. Uh, but we talk about that kind of stuff a lot. So when you think about the STEM programs, Sue Isbell, Sue, raise your hand real quick. She's right here in the middle of my screen. Um, she's in North Dakota and she wants to know, and I can hook you guys up, if maybe there's an opportunity for um, for them to, uh, for her students to come and take a look at the uh, Meteo Drone in North Dakota. Do they do tours? Absolutely. Absolutely. Sue, set you up with Jim. We'll connect you so that you and Jim can maybe organize um that'd be really cool so sue's up on the reservation up there in north dakota and her girls could come out and take a look at the actual uh meteor drone that would be awesome we have a we have a phenomenal partners over there uh at grand sky and uh with true weather and yeah I, we would we would love that we would absolutely love to have you out there and i i will definitely help make that happen absolutely that's great this is great um so we've got another question for um Amy and Amy, I'll answer this one. Uh, I know that you guys are running at the middle school up there, and Amy's North Colony uh, in New York. They haven't brought it into their elementary school yet. And the only thing I can say, Amy, is that if you look at a guy like Adam here on the screen, he was participating back in like fourth grade, and it's never too early. And the Tellos are a great way for the students as young as fourth grade to get hands-on practical experience. Um, I'm happy to have a conversation with anybody at your school. We can showcase what. Jim, we don't bother with my stuff. Excuse me. I'm sorry. That's all right. And we can we can showcase what we've done for others, and how other students have used it. Um, certainly, no shortage of examples of fourth, fifth graders using the program in their schools. To Jim's point, um, you know, this is a great opportunity, and that's why we do the drone programs because the students get excited about it because we're using drones for STEM. Um, so that's what I would say, Amy, is that if you want to have a conversation, I'm happy to talk to people. I think Mark is working with some of the middle schoolers at your school district. Uh, but I, I, you know, advocate for it. It's never too young, um, you know, to get these kids thinking about career pathways. I think the weather one's a great one because you hadn't really, you don't think of it, right? Like weather's weather, drones, drones, but how do you combine the two? And today we've seen it. Um, yeah, especially when you're talking yeah. about, you know, like you're seeing you're seeing drones deliver things now. <laughs> you know, I mean, like it, you can you can you know order something and depending on where you are and have it delivered to you in you know a couple of hours. I mean, like that's you think about the the way that it's impacting industry too. Like someone's got to get 
someone's got to forecast that they got to forecast for the for the you know for the drones the drones are forecasting for the drones it's it's fun and, uh, Jim, <laughs> why don't you uh, i know there's some people that want to talk to you outside of here i know can yeah time, I don't wanna, if you want to put out your um information like an email address or something in the chat or if you sure. want to give it out here the people can contact you. I know Trish has a question. She want to know if you maybe do some speaking outside of here and maybe speak to her kids. She's been trying to get drone legends into her school for quite some time now. She's kind of in the same boat as Amy. She's been advocating for it. Um, you know, some schools are ready to adopt sooner than others. Uh, so it's J Robinson, R O B I N S O N J Robinson at Medio Maddox, M E T E O. M A T I C S dot com. Meteorology and mathematics. That's how you get Meteomatics. Meteomatics. I love it. Yep. It's great. Jim, unless anybody has any other questions, uh, I want to thank you very much for your time tonight. That was an exceptional presentation. I learned a lot. I hope everybody else did. I, I have a new found appreciation for kind of weather data capture. That video is awesome. Look at that. <laughs> Adam, you could fly that thing. I know you could. Come on, Adam. The great thing about this is, is that you don't, once you can fly, you can fly, right? Yeah. I mean, there's going to be better proficiency levels, certainly when you start getting into the more FPV kind of stuff. But when you can fly a, a, a line of sight drone like this, you can fly it. Go get your 107 and start thinking that looks pretty cool. That's up there. So everybody, thank you very much. My name is Scott Buell. I'm the founder of Drone Legends. If you need to reach out to me, my email is scott at dronelegends.com. Scott at dronelegends.com. You can reach me there if you have any questions about our program or if you want to get connected with Jim. Uh, we're happy to have those conversations with you. This is recorded. It will be going out on our YouTube channel. It will be going on our Facebook page and it will also be posted on the resources tab of the dronelegends.com website. So um, thank you all very much for attending. I hope everybody enjoyed that as much as I did. Adam, awesome to see you, my friend. Keep doing really well. Stay in touch with me, please. All righty? Tell me how you're doing. Tell your mother I said hello. Thanks, everybody. Have a great evening.